We have typically valued common stock as being this element here as P0 is equal to D divided by R, right? But then in this case here is that we add in this flotation cost, right? Because we know that if we're going to issue preferred stock is that we have to account for flotation costs. When we substitute and, and solve all this around, that get, comes us down to this formula right down here, okay? Which is that the rate, we need to find that rate and then given, based off of what the dividend payments are off of that preferred stock, what the current pr prices and what our flotation costs are. Okay? And that's going to tell us what that rate of ret required return is on preferred. All right. So what are retained earnings? Retained earnings are the earnings that are left over after um, paying out our dividends to our shareholders. Right? Shareholders like to receive dividends because that is the, the disbursement of their uh, of their income and their, and their profit. But when we talk about retained earnings, is that this is basically just cash held. Okay, this is additional cash held back that they did not hand out to their shareholders, hand out to their owners. Now, companies might do this for a variety of reasons, but you know, this is a source of funding, right? Is it, uh, we see a lot of growth companies, a lot of tech companies, early stage companies, don't distribute very much in the form of dividends, right? Because they, they want to hold that back and use that to grow. Okay? Now, that has a cost, right? And that cost itself is opportunity cost, right? Is that if I am holding on to that cash, that cash is not free money. I'm holding on to that cash. I need to go out and invest it in something within my company in order to deliver a return for my investors, right? My investors have a required return. Let's say that my required return, a company for, with, with our beta and we come up with, is that the return on my company is, say, 12%. That's the required return for this company. What that's saying is that I need to have investments that are going to generate 12% returns for my investors. If I don't have good projects that are going to generate 12% returns for my investors, I should probably distribute these funds back to my investors, right? Because they need that 12%. They need this 12% amount right here, okay? So we have that opportunity cost because if I'm just holding on to this cash, it's not earning anything. Right? And my investors, my stockholders, could take that cash and go and invest it in something else that they find to be a good investment. Okay? So when we use this, this element on the retained earnings, is that we have to think about our investors. right? Because if we don't have any good projects, we should probably just give that money back to our investors. We're going to look at basically what our cost of retained earnings is. Is that we have three measures that we've looked at thus far, one of which is to come up with cap M, right? which we know as being the return, required return on I investment is equal to our risk-free rate plus our beta multiplied by the return on the market minus the return on the risk-free rate. Remember that this part right here is, just, is our equity risk premium. Okay. So you might see something where it's like, all right, we can use this method. You know, uh, Yahoo Finance or Morningstar or uh, Bloomberg or whoever says, hey, this is what our beta is. You come up with a valuation on your beta, and your company is looking at it and saying, all right, if I want to issue stock, if I'm doing this, is that I'm going to come up with this R here. Right? That's one method. Okay? We have two others. right? As we said, we have three different approaches that we can come up with R. Okay? One of them that we haven't really talked a whole lot about is this bond yield plus measure. Okay? Now, what the bond yield plus measure is, is that we take basically what the required return is on that I security, and that is going to be equal to the bond yield, okay, plus a, a risk premium on security I, right? This, isn't, this is not the equity over the entire market. This is just on that individual security. Okay, so we're going to be looking at that bond yield then. Our example that we used from earlier, right, is that we had a bond yield of 6.59%, okay? And what that means is that let's say that we feel that this stock is 4% riskier in, in the same company, right? Keep in mind, this is all in the same company. I issue a bond, and then because equity is riskier than a bond issue, is that I have to have that risk premium on top of it. Let's say that my risk premium on, um, on this bond here is, say, 3.2%, okay? Which means, right, that we just add it up, and we're going to end up with a 9.79%, okay? And that's going to tell us, hey, this is the amount of our... This is what our return needs to be.
Right? This is what our investors are going to require. Okay? Now there's a third measure. Okay? And of course, you know, this one's our Gordon growth model, right? Where we say that um, given we say that P is equal to D1 divided by R minus G. Okay? And you know, we can just move this this stuff around and basically tell us it tells us that R, just substituting and multiplying both sides by R minus G, dividing both sides by P, so it's that's D1 divided by P, right? And then we add both sides to G. Okay, so we're going to say that D1 divided by P0 plus G is going to tell us that discounted cash flow using that Gordon Grove model. Okay. So when we're looking at that there is that that's another measure. Okay. Now will these three measures, will, will they all say the same thing? Will they all say the same thing? And the answer here is that no, probably not. They're probably not going to all say the same exact thing, right? But they should all come within a reasonable bark, ballpark of each other. You know, there can be different factors here. You know, we talked about the beta on cap M. It might not be all that accurate. It might not be great. Um, you know, or the bond yield plus, that, that one is, is a, all three of these approaches, you come up with different numbers, and then we as managers kind of assign this thing saying, all right, this is what we, we actually really think that, that our cost is going to be on. on now, if you have any questions on any of these three measures, the cap and bond yield plus or discounted, ca discounted cash flow, uh, you know, there's a ton of other videos on, on my channel that you can check out here to, to figure out how to actually compute these. Right? Okay. Now, there's a little bit of a difference when we look at newly issued stock. Right? I had told you that the return on, so we said this is RS and then RE in our examples. Right, with RS being retained earnings, and then RE being new issues. Okay, when we do this, is that it's, it's basically the same exact thing. Is that we still use the same three measures to come up with what the cost of equity is. Just the only difference, and we're saying here, the only difference is that factor in flotation costs. Right, because when we issue new stock, right, we have to pay our investment bank in order to get that issue out there. So we have to, to pay that additional fee, which is going to increase our cost of, of new stock a little bit more. Okay? Um, so newly issued stock is slightly more expensive than our retained earnings, but it's not dramatically um, just due to the flotation cost. But it, it is, it's not something right, that we can do all the time. Um, so we want to save this for when we need a, 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 a big splash. So when we use our, our method, right, is that our, our new issued stock is that this is essentially, so we're going to say RE, so the return on new issued stock, return on equity, it's going to be our dividend in year one divided by the net proceeds plus our growth rate. Okay. And that net proceeds here, okay, we can think of as essentially being our price multiplied by the number of shares okay, minus our flotation cost, minus our, our, our total amount that we're paying to get this thing out there. Okay. So we can restate this equation right here. We can restate that by saying RE is equal to D1 divided by P0, 1 minus F plus G. And this is going to actually tell us. So what we see here is that this is, this is our Gordon growth. And then it's basically, and all it's doing here is it's taking our price, multiplying it by 1 minus our flotation cost, right? If our flotation costs are 2%, then this is going to be our current price multiplied by 0.98, right? Which is just going to ratchet up our, our, bar, our uh, cost of capital here just ever so slightly, okay? And this is the basic, basic way that we set it up. It's not, you know, the math itself is no different than the Gordon growth model. And if you're having issues with the Gordon growth model rearranging this equation, go back and look at some of the, the other videos.